Dr. David LeBlanc from Terrestrial Energy, and uh, he's going to talk about the Integral Molten Salt Reactor and the fabulous progress that they've made. Yeah, and thanks, John, for this conference. It's so many of us have met each other. Uh, my business partner, Simon Irish, we met through this conference and got to know each other over a couple conferences and uh, formed the business about five years ago. So uh, in a short talk, of course, I'm not going to get into too many details, but want to give you a bit of an update. The Integral Molten Salt Reactor is an advanced reactor in that community. It's a liquid fuel system, walk away safe. So we really pride ourselves on every action of shutdown, decay, removal, etc. is done passively. Um, it's a proven technology, as most of you know, from the uh, 1960s and 70s and 1950s at Oak Ridge. Uh, we're getting both Canadian and U.S. government support. We do have uh, affiliate company, Trestle Energy USA, that's acting under the, through the USA. It's more of a project company looking to site reactors in the United States. Uh, but most of our development is in Canada, and we hope to have a reactor in Canada first with the U.S. not too far behind. Uh, we're the first and only advanced reactor to reach the invitation-only second stage of U.S. DOE uh, loan guarantee program. First advanced reactor, and to our knowledge, the first uh, fission-based company to receive something from a sustainable development. So that was a watershed moment, I think, for all uh, nuclear vendors and recipient of two gain uh, awards from the US DOE. So that's helping a lot. Developing ourselves as a full engineering company with uh, a lot of things going on, relations, the, the, the spider web that we're trying to spread out here. Uh, we're very proud of the involvement we're getting with most of the major nuclear players in North America. Their advice along the way has been very, uh, uh, very valuable to us. Uh, but it is the, these are also the folks, uh, and they're represented at the high level of CEO or chief nuclear officer, et cetera. Uh, these are, of course, potential clients as well. So uh, that has been very successful for us. Uh, uh, too busy a slide to go through, but recent developments that you can kind of, if you go on our website and, and look at our news releases, but some of the important things were uh, in the first quarter of 2016, we entered the first stage of the regulatory process within Canada. These are pre-licensing activities, what they're called vendor design review, phase one. Uh, we were the first advanced nuclear reactor to enter that, probably in a sense worldwide. PRISM did some things in the 90s which would be sort of pre-application in the US, but that's another watershed moment. There's about five vendors behind us now. Uh, that process is just about finished for the first stage. My partner Simon Irish made up this slide and it's kind of grown on me as well. Why is it so important to have an advanced reactor, a different reactor? Well, light rod reactors, they've proven themselves good reactors, but uh, uh, fallen short on economics, etc. And it's so important for your fundamental safety case that can help you drive down cost of development. CapEx or the capital cost of your entire system is, is really a function of your system safety case. And that's about control, cool, and contain. And that safety case, if you make it a simple system, also at low pressure, etc., that really drops down your cost to develop, cost to license, and cost to construct. So that's really, we're not going to get these billed if they're as expensive as PWRs, we really end, or more expensive than coal, et cetera. We really need to get costs down. Uh, with the molten salts in general, and uh, there's a lot of variation in molten salt reactors, of course, uh, but you really have superior nature of control, cool, and contain. Control, you have the ability to have strong negative temperature coefficients so that they automatically, if the temperature goes up, uh, the power goes down or shuts itself off. Uh, different types of designs, uh, they have some minor issues. Uh, we're quite proud of the work we've done in the IMSR. Uh, so that allows you that they shut themselves down passively. And they can also control themselves just like the first aircraft reactors were uh, designed to be driven by how much heat you're pulling out. Cool, the fact that your liquid fuel allows the fuel to convect, to naturally circulate. So you have a lot more options to get rid of decay heat because that is the true challenge to nuclear operation. Uh, reactors shut themselves down pretty easily or you can shut them down, but it's dealing with that long-term decay heat if you've lost all power, et cetera. And we're proud of our system that, that runs 24 seven, is always losing a little bit of heat. I won't have time to get into it, but it's there when you need it. And then contain, we've heard about the chemical binding potential of the salts themselves. And just there's no driving force. There's no zirconium metal water interactions, uh, low pressure, et cetera. 
but I think you've heard a lot. So we, we feel we have high technological readiness in the IMSR. We've tried to follow the evolution of the MSRE, uh, that, that reactor that ran with graphite and a thermal spectrum, et cetera. Uh, the evolution in the late 70s to uh, design work on the denatured molten salt reactor, and also borrowing from more recent work from 2010 on an integral concept for solid fuel, the smarter. So we are a system that uses fluoride chemistry, proven in two reactors. We're a system that sticks to low assay, low enriched uranium. Uh, we could evolve in the future to higher enrichment, et cetera, but there is not the availability commercially of high assay, low enriched uranium right now. So we're sticking to under 5%. We start up well below that, and we use a makeup fuel of roughly that. So again, thermal spectra using graphite moderator. The fundamental, the, the simplest thing to differentiate is we have an integral design, so our primary heat exchangers are within the, within the reactor vessel. Uh, we love the use of graphite. It gives us lots of advantages. It does have challenges, uh, but the use of graphite means you have to think about replacing the graphite. So our solution to that is we'll replace, we'll, we'll set a power density that gives us roughly seven years for the graphite, and we'll replace that core unit. So we have multiple independent heat exchangers that if we have an issue with one, we can isolate. Um, but we're replacing that. So I know an engineering mantra is to get as long a life as you can, but with the, the massive cost of nuclear power, the small cost of these heat exchangers, the vessel, thin walled, is not very much to replace every seven years. And then the materials lifetime uh, equation of something that only needs to last seven years uh, is greatly simplified. Uh, so again, I don't have too much time to go through, but the, the, the basic idea is graphite core near the bottom here, fuel salt flows up, collected into a chimney. There's actually a liquid level here, so in a sense it's a pool type reactor. Uh, impellers pushing it through the tube and shell heat exchangers down an annual some return. And we start with that, it's sealed for the seven years, we trickle in a makeup fuel. We have what we call a switch loading arrangement, so we'll run a core unit for seven years, but we don't want to try to rush and try to disconnect piping and all that. Uh, we can drain the fuel salt after that seven years, but we have a switch loading where we'll operate the other, a second core unit in a second silo. That takes over operation, so the first core unit has a nice seven year period for, there's some things left behind, noble metals, et cetera, gives a nice seven year period to cool down. So that switch loading back and forth, but the, the used fuel salt, it has a great life for itself later uh, if we do some reprocessing, but we have no initial plans for any processing of the salt whatsoever. Um, it goes into storage in a shielded vault right next to it that also has the same passive cooling, and we can run the entire 60-year cycle of the facility uh, with this same um, shielded vault. Like I said, though, there's a lot of future value in that salt. Uh, we can recycle. You don't need to be a breeder reactor to close your fuel cycle and say that you're not putting uh, transuranics to waste. As long as you recycle the transuranics, you can close a fuel cycle with a burner approach as well. Very quick shot on balance of plant. And I want to point this out. We, we do, this is an old Oak Ridge idea. Almost everything, of course, is an old Oak Ridge idea. But we do prefer having a third loop. So we go from fuel salt that never leaves the container, a secondary clean fluoride salt takes the heat out. But instead of making steam from that, we like to go to a solar salt, a binary nitrate. Uh, it is much better behaved in the steam generators for electricity, but you can also think of producing steam for heat or uh, store that heat of the 600 degree solar salt uh, for thermal storage or doing all sorts of process heat works from desalination to H2 production, uh, synth fuels, etc. So that's a very important. Conventional light water reactors with their limits of about 300 degrees of output, there's so many processes that that's just not hot enough. We could have thermal storage. We can have a whole amount of things. And with the solar salts, they're very inexpensive. They're way beyond the nuclear island, so to speak. So they can be used for industrial plants that maybe are a kilometer down the road, et cetera. Uh, we do prefer salts that are much lower in tritium production. Yes, candus produce a lot of tritium, but it says tritiated water. And tritiated water is a lot easier to stop than tritium gas because it can go right through metal walls. Uh, so we prefer a system that dramatically reduces that in the first place. How long before you have a commercially demonstrable reactor? 
try to avoid saying a precise year anymore because we're in the regulatory process. And if we start advertising a particular year, that starts to speak for the regulator, but we are definitely planning in the 2020s. So it's likely gonna be late 2020s, which is, that sounds fast for a nuclear engineer, that sounds slow for most of you in the room, uh, but that is our goal. If you're avoiding tritium, that means you're probably not using lithium salt and beryllium salt. Well, both lithium and beryllium both produce pretty copious amounts of tritium, so. But after that, there's a whole recipe book of other sodiums, rubidiums, zirconiums, or uh, all these other ones that you have a chance. They're not quite as good neutronically, but uh, when a PWR's fuel cost is maybe 0.4 cents a kilowatt hour, including enrichment, uh, that's not where you're going to draw, drive down costs. So we, we have a good fuel economy and a evolutionary uh, pathway we know in the future to make it better and better and better. Thanks, Dave. Okay. Thank you so much, brother. Thanks again, John. Appreciate it.